I'm just going to get started anyway, and then people can come and go as they please. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trinity College NeuroSoc seminar series. We're, we're almost at the end of the seminars for the academic term, but it is my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Hubertus Himmerich, a clinical senior lecturer in eating disorders at King's College London and consultant psychiatrist at the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trusts, where he specialises in inpatient care for patients with eating disorders. Dr. Himmerich received his scientific and clinical training in psychiatry and psychotherapy at renowned institutions in Germany, including the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry and University of Mons in Mar Marburg. He has since been actively involved in the field of psychiatry, serving as a consultant psychiatrist at the Aachen University Hospital and a professor for neurobiology of affective disorders at the University of Leipzig. Dr. Himmerich's research interests are diverse, ranging from eating disorders and obesity to psychoimmunology, psychopharmacology and the therapeutic use of music. He's published over 180 articles in peer reviewed scientific journals and 40 book chapters in both English and German. As the co-chair of the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry, Task Force Eating Disorders, he has been instrumental in developing the updated guidelines for the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders for 2023. We look forward to hearing insights and expertise on eating disorders and related topics. And I would now like to welcome Dr. Hubertus Himmerich to take the floor. Oh, thank you very much, Amy, for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders. Um, let's have a look at the history of psychiatry and in particular the history of eating disorders and the history of psychopharmacology. Sir William Gall was the colleague who described anorexia nervosa first when he presented um, the case at a meeting of the Clinical Society of London in 1873. And then Gerald Russell coined the term bulimia nervosa in a paper published in 1979. And only one year later, bulimia was already included into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, third edition in 1980. And Albert Stankert described the third of the main eating disorders, which is binge eating disorder in a paper in 1959. And he described the disorder as an eating pattern, pattern that involved consuming an excessive amount of food. And then in 2013, binge eating disorder uh, was an autonomous and separate eating disorder described in the DSM-5. And three other New eating disorders were also included in 2013 in the DSM, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is characterized by a restrictive eating and avoidance of certain foods or food groups, a persistent failure to meet appropriate nutritional or energy needs without weight and shape concerns. And that's the difference to anorexia nervosa. The second new eating disorder is pica, which means the consumption of non-nutritive and non-food substances. And the third one is rumination disorder. And this involves repeated regurgitation of food and the regurgitated food may be rechewed and re-swallowed or rechewed and then spit out. Let's focus on the three main eating disorders <coughs> first. Um, the first one is anorexia nervosa. The prevalence is about 1% among women with a sex ratio of men to women of 1 to 10. Anorexia nervosa is characterized by significantly low body weight. And this means a BMI of 18.5 or 17.5 and lower an intense fear of weight gain and a disturbed body perception. The prevalence of bulimia nervosa is about one to 2% among women. And bulimia nervosa is characterized by recurrent binges, compensatory behaviors, and a self-evaluation that is unduly influenced by body shape and weight. <clears throat> 
We have already talked about binge eating disorder and that one of the symptom, symptoms is the binge eating, which means the consumption of large amount of foods, but there are no extreme compensatory strategies applied by the patient. And the prevalence is about 3% of the population. Let's also have a look at the history of um, psychopharmacology, because currently the outcome of eating disorder treatment is not ideal. About 30% of patients with anorexia nervosa reach full recovery. Uh, one third of patients um, learn how to live with a disorder, and 30% develop a severe and enduring eating disorder. And in other areas of psychiatry, the, the big breakthrough came with the development of psychopharmacological treatments. Um, let me mention the discovery of chlorpromycin by Pierre Deniker first. So he discovered chlorpromycin as an antipsychotic in 1952. And before that discovery, in Europe and in the United States, the asylum numbers increased. And there were more and more patients um, in these asylums. And only 6% of these patients uh, with psychosis, we, we would today say schizophrenia, were ever, being, were ever discharged. So most of the psychiatric patients with psychosis had to stay in hospital for their life. And the comparable figure from 1955 to 1967, after the introduction of chlorpromycin was 67%. So most of the patients could be discharged back to their homes um, where they could have a role in the family, where they could potentially um, start with their job again. Um, and that was mainly due to the development of uh, psychopharmacological treatment. Other treatments, for example, um, psychotherapy like psychoanalysis had long been developed at that time, but they didn't have such a massive therapeutic impact, um, beneficial impact for the therapy of our patients. And therefore, as I said, the new psychopharmacological drugs allowed the mentally ill to live their own homes, to live in their own homes and to obtain employment. And a similar develop was seen in affective disorders with the discovery of the first antidepressant imipramine by Roland Kuhn. Um, after the discovery of first generation antipsychotics and tricyclic antidepressants like imipramine, um, eating disorder psychiatrists try to use these medications in patients with anorexia nervosa. And there were a few randomized control trial in eating disorders in the 1970s and the 1980s, but these antipsychotics had no beneficial effect on the anorexic psychopathology, such as anxiety or body image disturbances. Even though some of the medications showed some superiority um, to placebo in terms of weight gain. And the same was true for the tricyclic antidepressants, no significant therapeutic differences were seen between the treatment um, of tricyclic antidepressants and placebo. But of course, the tricyclics um, were associated with adverse events in the treatment groups. Okay, so the overall impression was that first, that treatment with first generation antipsychotics and tricyclic antidepressants could not be recommended. And therefore, unfortunately, Patients with eating disorders could not benefit from the great breakthrough psychopharmacological therapies had achieved in other areas of psychiatry. This situation changed in 1972 
um, with the introduction of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor fluoxetine to the market in 1986. It was tested in patients with bulimia nervosa yielding positive results and it was approved by the US Food and Drug Administration in 1987. Fluoxetine is the most systematically studied antidepressant agent evaluated in both acute treatment and the prophylaxis of bulimia nervosa. So the most studied antidepressant in bulimia nervosa, I have to say, and the most studied um, medication in bulimia nervosa. Um, it um, has been shown to be highly effective for its effect, and it has a good benefit risk profile. Its acceptability justifies its use as a first line antidepressant in bulimia nervosa. And therefore we, we can say that fluoxetine was the first successful medication in eating disorders. Let me explain first how medication can work and where in the brain or in the neurotransmitter systems um, medication can unfold its um, potential benefit. Now the brain systems that regulate appetite and eating behavior are related to the question why we eat or why we don't eat. For example, if we have a certain um, idea how we want to present ourselves, how our body should look like, or if the society has a certain ideal of beauty, which is a, at the moment a very thin ideal of beauty, then these values can be embedded into eating behavior and we can um, decide not to eat. And these decisions are taking place in the prefrontal cortex and the input for the prefrontal cortex comes from the social and cultural factors and also from other thoughts we have about ourselves. Okay. Then another reason for us to eat is because we are enjoying ourselves. We are at a party, at a wedding or somewhere where, where people eat and drink. And that leads to a reward in the hedonic system. The hedonic system creates the desire to eat and gives us pleasure during food consumption. And this is uh, localized in the prefrontal cortex, but also in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. <coughs> and the input comes from the sensory organs and the hippocampus. A third important system why we eat or not eat is the homeostatic system. And this system makes sure that the body has enough energy. And therefore it integrates um, peripheral signals of food consumption and energy storages and regulates the appetite. And the anatomical structure associated with the homeostatic system is a hypothalamus. It receives peripheral signal, signals of food consumptions, for example, leptin um, as a signal molecule from the adipose tissue. And it also receives input from the self-regulatory system and the hedonic system. And here you can see these systems with their uh, messenger molecules, for example, opiates and uh, dopamine play a massive role in the hedonic system. Serotonin and noradrenaline play a significant, significant role in the self-regulatory system. And the homeostatic system receives these peripheral signals of energy storage um, from the body periphery, like, black, like leptin, for example. And um, for example, the stomach hormone ghrelin signals to the body that the signals to the homeostatic system that the stomach is empty and creates hunger. And then in the thalamus, um, certain 
regulatory peptides are released, for example, um, alpha MSH or CART, um, which are anorexigenic signals, or on the other side, neuropeptide Y and a good regulated peptide, which increase our appetite. For drug treatment, it's also important to consider comorbidities. And people have thought that, um, you, that frequent comorbidities are affective disorders, anxiety disorders, OCD, ADHD, and substance use disorders. And we know that these disorders are uh, associated with imbalances in the serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine, cannabinoid, opioid system. And, and therefore, people thought, well, let's try medications that are used in these psychiatric disorders and check whether they might be beneficial for patients with eating disorders as well. Okay. So over the last decades, and really since um, psychopharmacological agents have been discovered, um, studies, clinical studies were performed. And in the uh, task force eating disorders, we have at the World Federation of Societies of Biological, Society of Biological Psychiatry, we uh, made the effort to review all these studies to develop an update of the guidelines for the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders. And um, the days are over where experts can just sit at a round table and say what they think, uh, what might be helpful and review the literature and then draw the conclusions in a way they think conclusions should be drawn. We have meanwhile guidelines, how to develop guidelines. And for the World Journal of, and for the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry, Hazan and colleagues published these guidelines in the World Journal of Biological Psychiatry three years ago. And these guidelines tell you exactly how to create the level of evidence that a medication is effective or not effective, how to create the recommendation. And in these guidelines, it is um, said that clinical trials should have the priority. So not meta-analyses or systematic reviews. The task force had to go back to the individual clinical trial and evaluate the information we got from such an individual trial. <laughs> the guidelines also point out that you should not look just at the effectiveness as a medication, but also at other drug-related aspects, such as acceptance, adherence, or side effect, which makes sense because if you have a medication that works well, but patients don't want to take it, or patients start the medication, but then uh, stop the medication after a few days, um, this such a drug cannot be recommended. And the guide guidelines, how to uh, produce guidelines, also highlight that we, we should look at the study design in order to draw conclusions from a study, like was the control group appropriate or was it just like waiting list, uh, which annoys people when they are on a waiting list. So this is not really a control group as waiting list has negative effects. Um, then whether the, there's a similarity of conditions for the active and control group, um, how the randomization and blinding was, was done, whether people were really blinded and didn't know what they got. Then um, look at the sample size. Quite often, particularly the old psychopharmacological studies had quite um, small sample sizes with only like 15 patients in the treatment arm and 15 patients in the placebo arm. <clears throat> 
And also potential sponsor effects can play a role. For example, if you test a new medication versus an established medication, like a, a tricyclic antidepressant, you can choose the dose quite low of the established medication and that will almost guarantee you a good effect um, for your own medication compared to the old drug. So we had to look at these things for every single study. And in order to do that, we gathered quite a big task force from Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. And these colleagues are really experts in eating disorders or experts in psychopharmacological treatment. So first we did a systematic review um, to, yeah, of all the pharmacological studies in anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, avoidant restrictive restrictive food intake disorder, PICA and rumination. Then we did a sign rating. This is a rating for uh, the quality assessment of the studies. Uh, sign is an abbreviation for Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. Then we rated the level of evidence for, the, for whether a treatment is effective or whether a treatment is not effective. And then we did the grade of recommendation for or against an intervention. And we, of course, as I explained already, used additional information about the acceptability of a drug, its safety, etc. Here you can see how the sign rating is done. We use this uh, sign rating form. And this assesses the scientific question, randomization and blinding, similarity of treatment and control groups, how many patients dropped out, how appropriate the statistical approach was. And also um, it, it rates the overall assessment and quality of the study. <coughs> okay, and based on this information, we could do the level of, we could create the level of evidence and the grade of recommendation. Now, what is a strong evidence? That is if you have two positive, independent, high quality, randomized controlled trials with a, with a positive outcome. Now, if we had only one randomized controlled trial, that would only lead to level of evidence B and level of evidence C would be a low evidence. For example, if we had a few case reports um, or case series um, testing a specific medication. A negative evidence, for example, minus A would be evidence that the information is not effective. For example, minus A would be two randomized controlled trials would show that the treatment in question is not better than placebo, right? Then from this level of evidence, we can conclude the grade of recommendation. However, level of evidence A does not necessarily lead to grade of recommendation one because the medication might be effective but the tolerability might be low or it might have side effects or patients didn't adhere to it. So even if we have two positive studies, we have to look at, at these things. And then a, a medication where we have strong evidence might only get a limited recommendation or grade of recommendation too. And similar to the level of evidence we have negative, we, we could give a, grade of, a negative grade of recommendation, uh, which means a strong recommendation against the use of a certain pharmacological intervention. <coughs> now let's talk about the results. For anorexia nervosa, we identified 70 relevant articles. And most of the studies 
were done for olanzapine in anorexia nervosa and they used a dose of 2.5 to 10 milligrams per day. We have four positive randomized controlled trials and therefore we have a high level of evidence. However, the level of evidence is restricted to weight gain and in the studies, for example, in the study by Evelyn Atia, um, published in 2019, the adherence rate was low. So 50% stopped the olanzapine medication within the first 16 weeks. And additionally, all the studies were done, all the randomized controlled trials were done in adult patients with anorexia nervosa and therefore the effect in young people is less clear. And because of these problems, we only gave a grade of recommendation two, even though the level of evidence was A, which means a strong level of evidence. And here you can see how this is depicted in the guidelines. I have to admit that the guidelines haven't been published yet because I found too many mistakes in the in the proofs and therefore the publisher has to correct the proofs and then the article will get published. <coughs> but I already show you how it'll look like um, for anorexia nervosa. Um, the green line indicates the top choice, which is olanzapine with a high level of evidence and a grade two recommendation. There's also a randomized controlled trial, um, in particular a, a double-blind crossover trial for the use of tronabinol. And this is a cannabinoid receptor agonist um, using a daily dose of five milligram per day. As we have only one randomized controlled trial, this is only a level of evidence B and a great of recommendation two. Now, this is a control drug in the UK that is not licensed for the use of anorexia nervosa. It is, for example, licensed for patients with multiple sclerosis um, who have like um, therapy resistant pain. And then you can prescribe this cannabinoid receptor agonist dronabinol. In bulimia nervosa, we found 70 relevant articles. Most evidence was available for fluoxetine. Indeed, four randomized controlled trials tested fluoxetine in a daily dose between 20 and 60 milligram per day in the indication of bulimia nervosa. And they showed a good study outcome and these four randomized controlled trials had a high quality sign rating. And therefore we could say this is clearly a level of evidence A and the grade of recommendation one, which means a strong recommendation. We also found two randomized controlled trials for the anti-epileptic drug topiramate with a significant superiority of topiramate regarding binge eating and vomiting in bulimia nervosa. And therefore topiramate also got a level of evidence A and a grade of recommendation one. However, uh, one has to keep in mind that topiramate is not approved for the treatment of bulimia nervosa, um, neither in Ireland nor in the UK. It is, however, approved for epileptic seizures and migraine. <coughs> also, clinicians have to keep in mind that it's contraindicated in pregnancy and in women of childbearing potential if they are not using a highly effective method of contraception. And the problem is not just malformations, um, it's also been reported that children um, where the mother was on topiramate during pregnancy had learning, dif learning difficulties during school. <clears throat> 
Here you can see both recommendations in the guidelines, fluoxetin um, and topiramate with uh, grade of recommendation one. However, as most of the patients are females in childbearing age, I would say fluoxetin is clearly the first line treatment. And only if this doesn't help, um, we can think about topiramate as off-label use. In binge eating disorder, we identified 64 relevant articles. And um, of these articles, four were reports on RCTs, randomized controlled trials, and one response prevention RCT. And they had a positive outcome regarding binge eating eating frequency and body weight. And therefore we gave a level of evidence A and a strong recommendation for the use of Listex amphetamine. However, Listex amphetamine is only approved for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in, in Europe and also in the UK, but not for bulimia nervosa. And topiramide interestingly, is also um, effective in binge eating disorder, not only in bulimia nervosa. Three RCTs could show that clearly, and therefore topiramate also got a strong recommendation in binge eating disorder. However, topiramate is not approved for the treatment of binge eating disorder. I, I don't know any country where topiramate would be approved for binge eating disorder um, as it's a medication for epilepsy and migraine. Maybe I forgot to say that Listex amphetamine is approved for binge eating disorder now in the United States, Mexico, Israel, and some other states not the UK and not in Europe. Okay. And here you can see the rec recommendations, topiramate and Listex amphetamine. So these were the three main eating disorders where we found um, olanzapine effective in anorexia nervosa, fluoxetine and topiramate in bulimia nervosa and Listex, Listex amphetamine and topiramate for binge eating disorder. What about the new eating disorders like avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, PICA and rumination? For avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, we identified seven relevant articles, but none of those were randomized controlled trials. At least we found a retrospective chart review for mirtazapine and two case reports and therefore one can say, okay, if psychotherapy doesn't work at all, if we don't know what else to do, one might try mirtazapine in a patient with avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. <coughs> then what about PICA, which is um, characterized by the consumption of non-food, um, PICA is often a comorbidity of other disorders, for example, neurodegenerative disorders or obsessive compulsive disorder. And therefore, I would personally say, treat the underlying condition first, um, like dementia or OCD, and then check what is left of the PICA syndromes. We found two case reports for the use of fluoxetine. And therefore one could say, okay, there's some evidence and there's a low grade of recommendation for the use of fluoxetine. If you don't have any other better idea, I think among the medications fluoxetine would be the one that I would try. And we have other single case reports for the treatment of PICA with other selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 
with antipsychotics or with ADHD medication. In rumination disorder, um, we found two relevant articles. One was an open study on level sulpiride. And this is a D2 receptor antagonist with a prokinetic activity. So it makes the gut move faster. And it showed an improvement in 38% of people treated with levosulpirate, which means it helps about one third of the patients, but not everybody. Um, also the gamma immune gamma aminobutyric acid agonist baclofen was tested in rumination disorder in a double blind crossover study where 63% of patients reported a symptom improvement under baclofen compared to only 26% in the placebo group or in the placebo period as this is a crossover study. However, we couldn't give a strong recommendation for baclofen, even though it was it, it came out beneficial in a, a double blind crossover study, because in general, baclofen is known to have serious side effects like psychotic symptoms, depression, a balance disorder with faults or difficulties in the verbal expression. And for recommendations, you always have to balance the benefit and the side effects. <laughs> okay, so these were the uh, recommendations for the new eating disorders, even though not many studies have been conducted in these areas and we cannot make a strong recommendation. I would uh, sh like to show you where the medications that we recommended or our, our top choices work in the brain. Let's start with anorexia nervosa and olanzapine. Olanzapine is an antipsychotic agent and therefore it blocks dopamine receptors and it does not only block these receptors in the mesolimbic mesocortical system, it also blocks dopamine receptors in the hedonic system and in the nigrostriatal system. It also um, blocks histamine receptors. So it has an antihistaminergic property and all the antihistaminergic agents, regardless of whether they are antipsychotics or antidepressants, um, lead to weight gain. For example, the antihistaminergic antidepressant mirtazapine leads to weight gain or the tricyclic antidepressants, um, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, imipramine, um, they have a, an antihistaminergic uh, trait and therefore they lead to weight gain. Okay, and also olanzapine blocks some serotonin receptors and serotonin receptors have also been reported to be involved in weight regulation. Then bulimia nervosa, we said that fluoxetine um, is a serotonin re, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Thus it um, unfolds some of its activities at the serotonin system, but it also influences neuropeptide Y signaling. And then topiramate, which has been shown to be effective in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder affects the glutamate and gamma amino butyric acid signaling. It also affects um, iron channels as, as it is an anti-epileptic drug. Thus it influences the self-regulatory system. And we have um, found that Listex amphetamine the anti-ADHD medication is effective in binge eating disorder and Listex amphetamine influences mainly serotonin receptors, but also the dopaminergic system and uh, the homeostatic system. 
Okay, so there are a few limitations that I would like to mention regarding the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders and limitations of the guidelines. Regarding olanzapine, we can say that there are insufficient, there is insufficient data on anorexia nervosa psychopathology changes during olanzapine treatment. The evidence is restricted to weight gain. In the largest randomized controlled trial by Evelyn Atia, uh, which I mentioned already, the weight gain was modest um, as there was only a small BMI increase and the dropout rate was almost 50% during 16 weeks of treatment. And though so far, there is not much evidence for or against the use of olanzapine in adolescents. We are currently um, performing a feasibility study to test olanzapine in patients with anorexia nervosa. And we are including patients between 12 and 24 years old. If they don't show weight gain over four weeks um, in inpatients or daycare, if they are outpatients, they should have had at least four therapeutic sessions before they can in, be included into the olanzapine study. If the feasibility study is successful, we would like to proceed to a full randomized controlled trial. In bulimia nervosa, we recommended fluoxetine. And this is, of course, the first line medication for bulimia nervosa if psychotherapy alone is not effective. This is something I would like to point out for all eating disorders. Psychotherapy should be tried first, and only if psychotherapy alone is not effective, then we can add a medication. However, sometimes patients don't want psychotherapy, or psychotherapy is not available to them depending on where they live. And then it's better to try fluoxetine than to have no therapy for these poor people. In adolescents, only a small open study tested, bulim tested fluoxetine in bulimia nervosa with a significant decrease of binging and purging. However, uh, an open study is not sufficient to recommend a medication um, for, a patent, for a certain disorder. Fluoxetine and its metabolite norfluoxetine are potent inhibitors of the cytochrome P450 isoenzymes CYP2D6 and CYP2C90. And what does that mean? That means that we have to be cautious when we combine fluoxetine with other medications that are substrates of these isoenzymes, for example, the antidepressants amitriptyline, atomoxetine, clomipramine, imipramine, and several antipsychotics. So if we combine fluoxetine with some, something, we should always check the interactions. And CYP2D6 inhibition is important for the metabolism of tamoxifen to endoxifen. And tamoxifen is a medication used for the treatment of breast cancer. And breast cancer is a typical disease of women. So we have to be cautious not to prescribe fluoxetine um, if someone is on tamoxifen because tamoxifen will lose its, effic its efficacy against the cancer if we add fluoxetine. And of course, fluoxetine should not be combined with monoamine oxidase inhibitors because that might lead to a central serotonergic syndrome. The guidelines update focused on the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders only. We did not compare the pharmacological treatment with other biological treatments, for example, brain stimulation. We didn't compare it with psychotherapeutic or other treatment approaches. 
and whether a study was successful or not was decided with reference to the main outcome and the improvement of diagnostic criteria. However, other important outcomes were neglected. For example, people with anorexia nervosa have anxieties, they have sleep disturbances, and these outcomes were neglected as they are not classical criteria of the disorder. Patients have developed patient-related outcome measures and patient-reported experience measures, uh, which means expectations of patients, what a medication should do and what they would like to experience during the treatment. However, this, um, these PREMS and PROMS haven't been developed for eating disorders. We have neglected the comorbidities in our guidelines. And this is an important limitation um, because medication for another disorder, like for example, for depression, can have the side effect of worsening the eating disorder. For example, bupropion leads to weight loss and an increased risk for seizures. And people with anorexia nervosa already have an increased risk for seizures and for weight loss. And therefore, if someone has anorexia nervosa and depression and is prescribed bupropion, that can worsen the anorexia nervosa. Similarly, <laughs> If someone has depression and binge eating disorder, one shouldn't prescribe mirtazapine as mirtazapine can lead to weight gain and increase the binge eating episode frequency. So it's also important to think about the comorbidities and whether it's appropriate uh, to prescribe a medication for an eating disorder. Or we have to think about the eating disorder if we prescribe a medication for the comorbid um, psychiatric disorder. Most pharmacological trials in eating disorders, unfortunately, have a relatively short duration between 6 and 16 weeks. But it should be decisive whether um, a patient does better after one year, not just after six weeks because if, if someone improves and then goes back to um, the disorder, nothing is really gained from these six weeks of treatment. Okay, there are, there is of course a big media hype about psychedelic treatment in de depression, in PTSD, and now also in anorexia nervosa, and I am the principal investigator for the UK to test psilocybin uh, in anorexia nervosa. Psilocybin is the ingredient of magic mushrooms. This is why the press says uh, magic mushrooms trial, etc. But um, psilocybin is, is really produced as a chemical and we don't uh, get the psilocybin from uh, the cultivation of mushrooms. And we'll do a phase two randomized fixed dose double blind study with 60 participants. 45 participants will be recruited in the United States and 15 in our service um, and in the UK. Patients will be randomized in a two to one ratio to either 25 milligram psilocybin or one milligram psilocybin with psychological support. And what does psychological support mean? During the psychedelic drip, the patients will lie in a bed and two psychotherapists will sit next to them and guide them through the trip. And that makes sure that they don't have a bad trip or that they um, get panic or um, that someone will be there to, to help them and assist them. 
The primary outcome of this trial is to assess the efficacy of psilocybin with psychological support in improving anorexia nervosa symptoms. And the secondary objectives are obsessive compulsive symptoms and weight gain. And of course, we have a safety objective to assess the safety and tolerability. If you want, you can watch a YouTube video where I explain the study in more detail. I would like to thank mainly the WFSBP task force eating disorders, um, in particular Siegfried Kasper and Janet Treasure who gave intellectual input and know-how on guideline development. I would like to thank all the colleagues who did the systematic literature review with me and the sign rating. And I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hubertus, for a really interesting talk. And I think it gave quite an overview of how complex these disorders are to treat. Um, but it is exciting to see the resurgence and the new directions that are being taken in the field. And it will be exciting to see how the psilocybin trial turns out. So the best of luck with that. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the little chat box or if you feel more comfortable asking in person, feel free. Um, I have one while we wait. Uh, so. This is sort of, you mentioned it uh, on the topic of olanzapine for anorexia, that there weren't any really, like, I guess, markers to show that it actually targeted the underlying pathophysiology as opposed to just the BMI. Mm -hmm. Are there any biomarkers that we can use like going forward in studies that actually measure changes to the underlying pathophysiology driving the disease as opposed to changes that result from changes to weight? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. And unfortunately, most of the biomarkers we have, are, we have for anorexia nervosa are consequences of the self-starvation. For example, the low leukocyte count or electrolyte disturbances, um, etc. We would have, I, I guess we would have to look at the brain. Um, for example, look at connectivity. Um, another biomarker is the cortical thickness, um, but I believe this is also a consequence of self-starvation. But maybe the, the connectivity, uh, the decreased con connectivity is a cause for the disorder and not just a consequence. There have also been discussions around leptin because um, people say that in the in in our past, like three thousand, four thousand years ago, when there was a shortage of food, um, people would starve, and the fatty tissue would reduce, and leptin levels would fall, and that would um, urge people to exercise more, and maybe these very low leptin levels or something in the leptin sensitivity might be a future um, biomarker of the disease itself. And then we also have a therapeutic application as we can genetically produce leptin now. And there have been a few cases published by uh, Johannes Hebebrand from Germany and Gabriela Milos from Switzerland. So this, this would be an ideal scenario that you have a biomarker, which might be leptin. Um, and if it's low, you can um, give, give this uh, molecule as a treatment and that'll help potentially people with a subtype of um, over-exercising in anorexia nervosa. Good. Thank you, really interesting. Um, so there's just two more in the chat here. So Kira is thanking you for a very informative talk and asking, uh, do you think there are any challenges with recruiting participants with eating disorders compared with other patient groups? Yeah, I think so. Because, um, for example, 
Yeah, let's let's think about an example like depression. A, p a patient with depression knows that the depressive episode is something that doesn't belong to them. Whereas in anorexia nervosa, some pa patients really want to be thin, and it's very and you have to externalize the disorder first as a therapist and say oh, that what you really, really want. And when patients know that a medication leads to weight gain, they are particularly cautious because patients disagree uh, regarding the question, what, what is the main problem? Clinicians often see weight, the low weight as, a, as the main problem, as this is associated with physical risk. But patients use the self-starvation and the, the low weight gain to help themselves with, with difficult emotions, etc. And therefore, they see a treatment like olanzapine as taking away um, what they have found out for themselves, what helps them, like the, the, the low body weight, that helps with difficult emotions. So I think it's it's both it's the it's the patient group, as the disorder is so entrenched in the patients, but it's also the fact that we don't have medications that are particularly developed for eating disorders. So all the medications we have are repurposing. Um, medications from other disorders like antipsychotics or antidepressants for the use in eating disorders. And therefore, I think this is also the challenge that we can't say this is a medication that's specifically targeted at an eating disorder uh, symptom. It's, it's always like a side effect or an additional benefit that we see and other disorders and then we advertise the medication to patients and we of course know that it will help to a significant extent um, but there will be um, a lot of psychological and psychotherapeutic work to do even if someone is treated with the current medications the medications only make it easier and increase the chances of achieving full recovery. Thank you. And there's one more here from Imogen um, asking, in terms of drug slash treatment compliance, how can that be managed in clinic for patients with eating disorders? Yeah, I mean, in as I work in inpatients and there it's quite easy. You can check whether a patient takes the medication and then motivate them to take the medication or if someone is on tube feeding you um, can give the medication through the NG tube. Now out, in outpatients it's much more difficult as you don't know whether the patient takes the medication or not. Then you can for example measure the blood level of the medication um, or you can try to encourage the patient to be as open as possible um, to report whether they take the medication. But I think the uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is the only objective way to measure compliance. Great, thank you. Uh, I can't see any more questions, but if there are any more, feel free. And if not, we'll just say thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. And we will be uploading this on our YouTube channel. Excellent. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And also thanks for the questions. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, right. bye everyone. Bye, bye.